Very good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and allow me to welcome you to this fourth installment of an eight-part seminar series. Today, our focus is on education, and we've aptly titled this seminar, Lifting All Boats, the Effect of Better Quality and More Education on Africa's Development. My name is Nico Koza, and I am with the African Union Development Agency. And for those that are joining us for the very first time, welcome to you as well. And as mentioned, this is the fourth of an eight part series where each session focuses on a specific development area. And ultimately the outcomes of these discussions will serve as an input into a think tank inception conference on Africa's integrated development prospects. The conference will be held in Ethiopia, Addis Ababa from the 4th to the 6th of October later this year. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the AUDA NEPAD Policy Bridge Tank Program, together with the African Futures and Innovation Program at, at the Institute for Security Studies, is jointly hosting this seminar, which seeks to explore how improving the level and quality of education could impact the continent's development trajectory. Now, it is a well-known fact, and not many people can argue with this, but we know that education can have a transformative impact on African economies and societies, although it is slow moving. So this morning, the seminar will focus on this whole aspect of education and look at three main elements in particular. As a start, the seminar will look at the current context of education in Africa, as well as its expected trajectory to 2043. Then we will receive a, a presentation of an education scenario that really targets every level of the formal education flow and show the potential of education as a development accelerator. We'll then look at how improving not only the level, but as well as the quality of education can positively impact the continent towards the trajectory of 2043, which will translate into increased GDP per capita, declining poverty levels, as well as other benefits that really derive from us as Africa getting on the right track when it comes to education. Now, Oh, excuse me. Now, before I hand over to our presenter, I would like to encourage all of you, and I'm sure there'll be many questions that will come out of um, the session. So if you have any questions, please make note of them, uh, pop them in the Q&A box, and towards the end of the seminar, we will make sufficient time for us to actually just address and discuss some of those questions. Today, our presenter is Mr. Enoch uh, Randy Akins. Uh, if you can give us a wave there, he's looking very ready. If you can give us a wave, um, Enoch, there just to show us that you are ready for us. Excellent. Now, Enoch joined the ISS in January 2022. Um, as a researcher in the African Futures and Innovation Program. And prior to that, Enoch was a research as well as programs officer at the Institute for Democratic Governance in Accra, Ghana. He has also worked as a research assistant uh, in the economic division with the Institute for St Statistical, Social and Economic Research at the University of Ghana. Um, Enoch holds uh, an MPhil in economics from the University of Ghana. We are also joined um, this morning by Dr. Rainer Klingholz, who will be our respondent today. If I can just encourage you, just Dr. Reynolds, uh, Dr. Rainer, sorry, just to switch on your camera and give us a wave. Dr. Rainer? All right. Feeling a bit camera shy, I think, for now, <laughs> but I will introduce him more fully um, after our presentation. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Dr. Renia. So I will introduce you more formally, of course, um, when you then do give us your response. Um, but without any further ado, uh, Enoch, we stand ready. We are excited to really hear what, you know, how transforming our education systems, what that could really look like and the kind of impact it would have for the continent. So Enoch, allow me to welcome you to make your presentation. Welcome, Enoch. Thank you, Nico. And thank you for summing up my presentation for me. So I'll be presenting from the African Futures website. Uh, so I'm sharing screen. Can you see my screen? Affirmative, Enoch, we can see your screen. Okay, thank you. So um, just as a way of background, if you go to the African Futures website, 
we have forecasts for every African country and income group. So if you check the geography, you see reports on the development trajectory for every African <coughs> country and income group in Africa. So whether it's regional economic community, ECOWAS or North Africa, we have reports for each of these African countries, uh, the forecast for them. And then also we have sectorial or thematic reports. We have demographics, agriculture, health and wash, which have been treated earlier. And today I'm presenting on education. Uh, I'm, I'll be presenting on education uh, thematic area. So this is the education report. The report is available online. You can download it. Uh, and then we have the summary and the 10 top takeaway. So like Nicole said uh, in the introductory remark, education is important because it's the surest way to transform our society. Education is the foundation of human development and self-actualization. And at the individual level, education improves the knowledge and skills of an individual and also help them to be more competitive uh, in securing jobs and uh, increasing wages. So studies have shown that an additional year of schooling can raise the earnings of an individual by 10% per year. So education undoubtedly is important for each and every individual. And at the macro level also, education has transformative effect on the economy. It improves uh, labor contribution to growth by raising the productivity of labor. Uh, research shows that for every additional year of schooling is associated with an increase of about 0.6% uh, increase in GDP over a long term period. So I will start by showing uh, education, the context or the state of education in Africa. Um, so if you see, if you can still see my screen, the chart one, it shows the progress of the levels of education in Africa. And here, because of the distinguished features between uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa, we're breaking them into two and compare with the levels in South America, South Asia, and then the averages for the world. So if you can see on the left-hand side uh, is a percentage uh, rates. And here the figures are in gross enrollment, uh, they, they are gross. So if you see the first column is for Sub-Saharan Africa, and you see, notice that the educational funnel for Sub-Saharan Africa is very steep compared to other regions. So if you take the first, which is a primary, gross primary enrollment for Sub-Saharan Africa, it's almost at the same level with other regions. Uh, that's the 1.7%. One uh, it's almost at the same level with North Africa, which is 1.06 and uh, sub, uh, South America and the average for the world. It doesn't differ that much, but you see that Sub-Saharan Africa educational funnel is leaky compared to other regions. So as you move uh, along, as you move through the funnel, you see that there are a lot of people that drops out compared to other region. So with a gross enrollment rate at the primary level of 10.17, you will see that uh, gross primary rates drops to 67.5. And if you compare this to the gross primary, uh, the, the gross primary completion rates uh, for North Africa, which is 101.5, then you see that there was a vast difference in Sub-Saharan Africa the funnel leaks massively. Uh, there are a lot of people that enrolled at the primary level, but they, are, they do not complete. If you move to the secondary level also, the same is there. So the lower secondary gross enrollment rate for Sub-Saharan Africa is 58.4%. If you compare this, say, to uh, North Africa, it is 98.6%. And if you compare that to South, uh, South America, which is 108.1%, you will see that Sub-Saharan Africa is lagging behind and trailing other regions. And then if you take a look at um, the lower secondary completion rate also, 
the percentage drops further to 44.3% and compared to say the 78.6% in North Africa. And by the time you get to tertiary, we have only nine, uh, about 10% of um, gross enrollment at the tertiary level compared to about 37.6% enrollment rates, uh, gross enrollment rate at the tertiary level for North Africa and 41% average of the, uh, globally. So from here, you can see that Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa funnel is very leaky compared to other regions, whilst North Africa is also leaky, but it's relatively okay and uh, is similar to other uh, regions such as South America and South Asia. So that is by way of assets. You see, there are a lot of people that are enrolled at the primary level, but as they go through the funnel, they drop out and are not able to get to the tertiary level. So that by uh, the number of people that come, the percentage of people that completes uh, tertiary education, the gross completion rate at the tertiary level is just 6%. Uh, if you take the world average of say 27.2%, you see that there was a vast difference in that. So that is by way of access uh, for education in Africa. And that is not just it. If you look at beyond the issue of access, there are also gender issues. Uh, there are also gender inequality. Uh, in terms of access to education in Africa. So if you can see my screen chart eight uh, gives uh, the gender parity gross enrollment for Sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa for 2019. So uh, if you check primary level, you see that the primary level uh, for Sub-Saharan Africa for every hundred boys that are enrolled, there are 96 girls and that is quite, uh, uh, okay, if I may say, uh, uh, compared to say uh, North Africa, which is 99 girls per 100 boys that are enrolled. But as you climb up the ladder, you realize, uh, you notice that the enrollment rate for girls drops uh, for Sub Saharan Africa, whilst that for North Africa is the opposite. So for secondary school enrollment, you will see that. For every 100 boys that are enrolled in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, 91 uh, girls are enrolled. And then uh, for North Africa, it is 98 uh, girls per 100 boys. Uh, for secondary, upper secondary in Sub-Saharan Africa, you notice that for every 100 boys, there are 87 girls that are enrolled at the upper secondary level. And by this time, uh, North Africa has more uh, girls that are enrolled uh, in upper secondary. So for every 100 boys, there are 103 girls. And when you move to the tertiary, you see that the, it drops significantly, that the gender gap increases so that for every uh, 100 boys that are enrolled in tertiary level, 80 uh, girls are enrolled in sub-Saharan Africa. And the reverse is the case in North Africa, where the gender gap favors uh, uh, the girls. So for every 100 boys, there are one, one six girls that are enrolled. So you see that there are also, uh, beyond the low access compared to other regions, there is also the issue of the uh, what you call gender gap that also affects education uh, in Africa that affects education in Africa. And aside that also the levels of, um, aside that also the levels of uh, vocational education in Africa is low, especially Sub-Saharan Africa is low. So for instance, in 2019, the proportion of people that are enrolled in vocational programs in Sub-Saharan Africa was less than a quarter of the rate in North Africa. And the proportion of people that are enrolled in science and engineering background is also quite low in Africa. So this is uh, by way of the state of education in Africa. And these outcomes have even further been worsened by the COVID-19 pandemic that disrupted uh, the education in Africa. So 
the, the study research has shown that during the peak of the pandemic, more than 90% of African students had their studies interrupted due to uh, school closures. Of course, the pandemic was global and other countries were also hit, but you know, because in Africa we have low uh, internet access, it was difficult to have virtual classrooms to continue with education. So the key point from here is that education in Africa, the access rate is low compared to other regions. And then there are also uh, challenges with gender equality at all levels and uh, uh, technical and vocational education uh, as enrollment or access is also low in Africa. So based on this identified problem, we develop an education scenarios that models the impact of more and better education in Africa, more and better education in Africa. So it looks at both uh, the access rate, it looks at the, uh, the quality uh, and then the access. Yes, so if you look, if you can see my screen, the education scenario, we model every level of education to improve both the access and the quality. Yes, the quality of education is also uh, very low in Africa uh, at all levels. So for primary level, we improve on primary net intake rates, and then we improve on the survival rates at the primary level, and then the test scores to uh, as a proxy for the quality uh, that is supposed to improve uh, the primary education outcome. And then we repeat the same thing at the secondary level. Also, we improve the lower and upper secondary transition rates and improve the lower and upper secondary graduation rate, as well as the test scores at the uh, secondary level, uh, both upper and lower secondary. Then we do the same for tertiary, where we improve the tertiary intake and then tertiary graduation rates, and then also try to close the gender gap, uh, try to close the gender gap, and as well uh, improve the share of science engineering and vocational education in Africa. And this we do with the underlying assumption that education is important for development and this is supposed to improve human capital contribution to growth, human capital contribution to growth. So these are the parameters or the intervention that we use to model our education scenarios and the specific uh, parameters and the interventions are listed in ANES of the study. So uh, those that are interested can have a look at how we model the specific interventions for each uh, country, for each country. So if we look at this, um, based on this scenario, we look at the impact of our education uh, scenario on say GDP in Africa. Um, so if you look at the impact of education, on say GDP, as if you can see from my screen, you will see that um, by 2043, on the current path, that is the current development trajectory of Africa, by 2043 is expected that each GDP per capita is supposed to be around 8.5 trillion by 2043. By the education scenario uh, improves, uh, GDP, uh, improves GDP uh, to 8.8 .8 trillion. So the edu an improved education, improved access to education and better quality can increase GDP by additional 368 uh, billion, which is equivalent to 4.3% of GDP in Africa. 4.3% uh, of GDP in Africa. So we see that education has significant impact on GDP. Even though the impact is slow moving, uh, it takes a long time for the impact of education to be felt. So you see, uh, if, if you model this to say 2063, the impact of education on GDP is going to be much larger than it is now because education is slow moving and the impact even takes longer. Uh, it, and it makes sense because it takes longer to train a child from uh, uh, primary school up to the university where it becomes more productive and more relevant uh, to contribute to growth. So 
That is uh, the impact of education on GDP. If you are supposed to look at GDP per capita also, you will notice that if, if you look at GDP per capita, education and improved education also have better outcomes uh, in terms of GDP per capita. So if we increase uh, our better education can lead to an increase of say 240 uh, US dollars in 2017 per uh, person in Africa. Now the effect of education differs across in uh, different countries, particularly across income groups. So if you see my screen chart, 16 shows the increase in GDP per capita uh, model, uh, different income groups in Africa. So the figures are in USD 2017. Um, if you can see, you will notice that the low income countries, the impact on education on high income countries is much larger compared to low income countries. So if you, uh, for high income country, Africa, which is Seychelles, the impact is almost 600 uh, US dollars per person uh, by 2043. For upper middle income countries like the North African countries and South Africa, you notice that the impact is about 458 US dollars per person by 2043. And then for lower middle income countries, uh, it is uh, around 283 US dollars uh, per person. Uh, and then for low income country, it is 149 uh, US dollars per person. So the impact of education on countries uh, differs based on their economic, uh, what do you call them, based on their income levels. And it makes sense because richer countries are able to offer more and better uh, edu quality education and also they have the structures also to absorb uh, the, the productivity of labor. So that is how come they are. So if you check this across countries also, you will notice that high income countries uh, in Africa are the ones that benefit more from education. So you see that uh, Libya, Seychelles, Gabon, Egypt, Botswana, those are the ones with the higher returns on the impact on education, uh, in a more improved education, and then Burundi, Central African Republic, and then Sierra Leone and low income countries with the least impacts uh, on education. So in terms of poverty also, uh, you will notice that the education scenario also has an impact, significant impact on poverty in Africa. And you see this is the, the blue line represent the current part where Africa is the poverty level measured in $190, US $190. And it, uh, the chart show the proportion of people that are below the poverty line, 1.9. And the blue line is uh, the current part. So by 2043, there was, it's estimated about 17.8% of Africans' population is likely to be uh, live below $1.9. The education scenario reduced this to about 15.8%. Uh, uh, that corresponds to 47 million people that are, can be lifted out of uh, extreme poverty by 2043 based on the education scenario alone. Like I said, the impact of education takes longer time uh, to manifest. So if you model this into 2063, you see that the impact will be much larger uh, than it is now because it takes a lot of time for education to have that transformative effect uh, that we expect. So that is by way of our modeling and uh, how it impacts on uh, the income how it impacts on income and poverty. So based on this, we have uh, key uh, recommendations uh, that uh, we think that can help to improve the level of education in Africa. So as a start, government must start by looking at foundational level, uh, which is the preschool. Most of the time we don't pay attention 
uh, African government don't pay attention to preschool learnings. They only focus, start focusing on primary education. But preschools are important. Pre-primary level learnings are important to improve education levels, especially in acquiring basic numeracy and then literacy skills at that level helps a lot. And then also, we, uh, in order to improve the access rates of education, policies such as free education uh, to help increase access to poor households that are unable to afford uh, can help. And then also programs such as uh, school feeding programs uh, that helps a student to stay in school because most students, uh, especially from poor households, do not go to school because uh, of basic malnutrition issues. So school feeding programs uh, has shown to be very high effective in increasing enrollment at the primary level and secondary level, especially when it's accompanied with a feeding program because children are eager to go to school because of their food and other stuff. And then also the government need to uh, government needs to prioritize technical and vocational education in Africa, starting from the lower secondary, which is uh, which is more relevant to work. It is not enough uh, getting people through the educational system, but the skills that they acquire must be relevant to jobs. So we must prioritize Africa must prioritize vocational and technical education so that its graduates have uh, enough and relevant skills that they can compete in the fourth industrial uh, revolution. And then also due to the global uh, financing crunch, Africa has to find innovative ways of finding its education or find its education. Education budgets are very high in Africa and they need a way of sustaining it by roping in the private sector uh, to partner in areas such as the vocational, and technical education that can have direct impact on private sector and to help them uh, pay for some of these things. Of course, there should be efficiency in the spending because inefficiency in spending also is one of uh, a main challenge in education uh, regarding education in Africa. And then the other thing also is we have all seen based on the pandemic that Education does not need to be just a uh, classroom face-to-face, -face, but uh, virtual as well. But the cost of data in Africa is high and internet access rate is low. So for education to be able to have the impact that we need, there is a need now to be able to broaden the horizon, not limit education to only uh, classroom face-to-face, -face, but also improve virtual learnings. And this can come about if there are uh, increase internet access and also the cost of broadband is brought down. So government need to partner with other uh, more telecommunication firms to be able to do that. And then uh, increasing uh, capacity building for teachers and skills upgrading is important to be able to um, improve the levels of education and the quality in Africa. Most teachers uh, in Africa, the quality is very low and there are not consistent training and up, uh, skills upgrading that are done for teachers to be able to be innovative and meet the changing educational context. And this must be prioritized to be able to meet up uh, with the changing educational context. So these are by way of recommendations in concluding on this, um, Education is important for Africa and Africa has the potential to be able to increase uh, its education, provide better education. The AU estimate that by 2050, 40% of all children in the world will be in Africa. And this is a huge opportunity for Africa to be able to build the largest human capital in the world and leverage it for growth if it is able to train them well through providing access to uh, better education. And that can help Africa uh, to transform Africa that we want. I will end with a quote, uh, Malcolm S says that education is a passport to the future for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. And Africa must prepare for its education today. Otherwise, there'll be no tomorrow for us. Thank you. I will stop here and take questions.
Thank you very much, Enoch, and a round of a, a virtual round of applause, uh, you know, to you and the team for really putting together such a comprehensive, comprehensive analysis, really, uh, of not only the state of education currently as it stands in Africa, but really beginning to model scenarios of what it would look like. Um, you know, in, and in, in terms of the positive impacts, in terms of GDP, um, in terms of its impact on poverty, very interesting insights that have come out, some of which I will actually pause myself and raise when we then do go um, into the Q&A session. So very well done. Um, and thank you very much for that, um, Enoch. Um, ladies and gentlemen, allow us now to then move over to the next um, element uh, for our sem seminar today. Uh, we'll now be hearing from Dr. Rania Klin Klin oh, Klinholz, please pardon me for that. Um, Dr. Rania holds a PhD in molecular biology. He worked as a research assistant at the University of Ham Hamburg and was science and environment editor for the German Weekly Desert and head of the science department of Geo Magazine. Um, from 2003 to 2019, he served as Managing Director of the Berlin Institute for Population and Development, an independent think tank, think tank for demographic issues. Uh, Rainier has written a number of books about climate change, global population trends, um, as well as the benefits of education. He was also a fellow at the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Study in South Africa um, in 2013, 2015, as well as 2019. Um, Dr. Rainier, highly accomplished, and we absolutely look forward just to hearing your insights in terms of the presentation um, that we have received this morning, and really your thoughts in terms of really what benefit would derive for Africa um, in us really getting our education systems right. So, Dr. Rainier, over to you, please. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, loud okay, and clear thank you. can hear you. Thank you, Nico, and thank you, Enoch, for your interesting presentation. Um, uh, what you described in your report is an, is an old phenomenon. The standard of education in sub-Saharan Africa has been lagging behind for uh, a, a world average for ages. Almost everybody knows it. The consequences are well known in academia by the World Bank or UNESCO. Uh, it's known in governments, but changes come very slow. So the region with the youngest population and theoretically the greatest potentials becomes a region of lost opportunity. Uh, the report shows all that in frightening detail. Uh, it shows some obvious correlations. For instance, low education levels correlate with high poverty rates. Low education correlates with high fertility, which makes it even more difficult to provide adequate education for the growing number of children. Even constant enrollment rates, which should be the minimal goal for, for an education policy, become difficult for poor countries like uh, Niger, Chad, uh, or Central African uh, Republic that have a very high population growth. So the question is what can be done and what has to be done? The study definitely recognizes the crucial variables to improve the education system from a reduction of the dropout rates at all levels of education uh, to gender parity or an increased share of science and technology qualifications, both in tertiary education and in vocational training. Uh, more qualified and more motivated uh, teachers are crucial uh, or an extended use of digital learning in the classrooms. Online learning doesn't replace teachers, but it can enable them to teach better. Uh, the question is, how can all this be achieved? Uh, your scenarios to 2043 are very ambitious, but they reflect a lot of wishful thinking. Uh, I mean, we have a comparable situation here in Germany. We know a lot about education deficits in our system through comparative studies like PISA or TIMS, but we are not very good in correcting these deficits. So it would be interesting to present some best practice examples uh, they can be found all over Africa, and they show that good education results can be possible even under difficult conditions. For example, Liberia has identified more than 2,000 so-called ghost teachers that had cash in uh, the salary but never showed up. These individuals in this program were fired and replaced by better trained teachers. So this is kind of a success story. 
Ethiopia has increased preschool attendance with the school readiness initiative from basically 0% to over 50% within 10 years time. Kenya introduced its Tusoma program. Tusoma means uh, is Swahili and, uh, and means let's read uh, and could improve the reading skills of primary students significantly. A key element of Tusoma were so-called curriculum support officers that regularly visited the schools, monitored the success of the program and supported the teachers in implementing their pedagogical concepts. So a mix of control and support to the teachers certainly was the key of the program success. Uh, another uh, example, uh, a good practice example is Ziyavula, which is an online learning platform from South Africa, which supports students in learning and helps teachers to improve their teaching. When South African teachers went on strike nationwide in 2010, the Yabula was called to at least allow students to prepare for their final exams. In 2014, the plan of the government, of the South African government, to supply the entire country with open, open educational resource textbooks failed completely and resulted in no textbooks being printed for, uh, at all for three years. So again, the Yabula jumped into this void and negotiated an agreement with two large mobile phone providers to allow students to download educational programs free of charge. So there are very good ideas around. Uh, they just have to be able to fly. Uh, these good ideas and best practice, uh, uh, best practice uh, in, uh, are interesting for, for instance, in South Africa, and you, you are based in South Africa, uh, and South Africa has the costliest education system in Africa, but probably the lowest return of investment. Uh, Jonathan Jansen, an edu the education expert from the University of Stellenbosch, estimated that South Africa has about 20% good schools and 80% dysfunctional schools. And he means really dysfunctional. South Africa has excellent private schools and universities, but they are unaffordable to the majority of the students. So this is a new form of apartheid where access to education doesn't depend on your skin color anymore, but on the wallet of your parents. And it shows that the South African government has little interest in equality. But on the other hand, there are top schools in poor districts, in poor South African districts as well. Good schools don't have to be expensive. They just have to focus on doing the simple things properly. They need a good management, motivate, motivated teachers, rigor and sensi sensitivity. One example is COSAT uh, in Kayalicha, the biggest township in, in, in Cape Town, that particularly focus on math, science, and computer science. In 2011, COSAT ranked among the top 10 schools in the Western Cape, which is the reason that has some very good schools. Uh, and that means that the potential for better education is available not only in South Africa, but all over Africa. It just has to be unfolded. Just one other critical remark to your study. Uh, you compare education standards of Sub-Saharan Africa to North African standards and praise North Africa for its results, which in fact are better than in Sub-Saharan Africa, especially in terms of tertiary education numbers. But you have to be careful in interpreting these, uh, these numbers. First, many students in North Africa go for non-science and technology subjects, hoping for a job in civil service which normally cannot made be available. As a result, a large number of young academics remain jobless and frustrated. Even if they study math or science, many are not prepared for employment. In fact, it were the highly educated young people in North Africa remaining excluded from the labor market that caused the Arab, Arab Spring in 2010, which in fact was an Arab turmoil. These educated but jobless people remain the gunpowder for more social and political unrest in North Africa and in the rest of Africa as well, if they don't find a job. So in order to harvest a demographic dividend, you not only need human capital in terms of health and education, as you quote your colleagues in your, in your uh, report from YASA in Austria, the demographic, demographic dividend doesn't come automatically. You need an environment where private enterprises can flourish, where jobs are created. Otherwise, your precious human capital is wasted 
education without jobs doesn't lead you anywhere. But first, of course, you have to give the young Africans the opportunity to let their human capital grow. Thank you very much. Dr. Renia, thank you so much for really that really succinct summary uh, and, and your response to the presentation that uh, we, we, we've received earlier on. And I think that you started off with making such a, you know, a poignant point that the, the, the report itself, absolutely, you know, really good and ambitious, um, you know, you know, targets that are being set out there. But I also like the fact that you spoke about how can we also leverage on, you know, actual experiences and best case scenarios that we actually have on the continent to actually ensure that countries can learn from one another, but as well as to set the continent on that trajectory that can really be spearheaded, um, you know, by an improvement in the quality um, of education as well. And I think also mentioning the fact that it will take a multiplicity of players and stakeholders for us to really make um, you know, use of or to realize the demographic dividend that it won't necessarily just become an automatic um, element. So you spoke about how can we work together with the private sector? Um, how can we join forces and really ensure that we put in place an ecosystem that really does make for a, a, a thriving um, education system across our countries on the continent as well. So thank you very much um, to you for that as well. Now, I wanted to invite all of the participants not to forget to make use of our chat function, our Q&A function, if you have any questions, any comments, uh, or any insights as well that you would like to share, um, those would be most welcome as well. I'll just use this opportunity just to just see which questions we've had in coming and which ones we can then address. But perhaps while I look through, um, you know, just an interesting question. Um, when you began, you, sh you showed us a, a, a slide that basically had, you know, showed us the st statistics in terms of growth enrollment. And at primary level, Africa is doing so well. Well, Sub-Saharan Africa, but along the continuum, um, that seems to then, you know, decrease and go down. Um, can you share any insights in terms of what accounts for that? And, and perhaps if the report also goes into elements to say, how can we then improve um, on, on that particular pattern that's emerging? Um, Enoch, any, any thoughts? And perhaps I'll even open it to yourself as well, Dr. Ray, to just share um, your insights as well. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Enoch. We can hear you. Yes, yeah, so uh, thank you. So like you rightly stated, the educational funnel in Africa is leaky. As you climb up, more people drop along the line. And it's the high enrollment rates um, in the primary level is partly due to most uh, free education, uh, most African countries having free education uh, at that level, and also the cost of educating people at the primary level is quite low. Um, if you look at the cost of education, for instance, um, if we look at education expenditure, I wanted to share screen, you realize that it is more expensive uh, to educate a person at a tertiary level than at a primary level. So, um, Aside the fact that the, there are free education program that usually covers the basic level, that ensures that access is not limited to poor households and access is universal also. Uh, the cost of educating a person itself at the uh, higher levels is high, it's more expensive. So people are not able to afford, uh, poor households are not able to afford so they finish uh, the basic level, the primary school, and getting into secondary school becomes difficult, or even the tertiary or the university. So the cost factor uh, is important, and it's one of the main factors that excludes people from uh, getting into higher education. 
Thank you very much um, for, for that, um, you know, and then one other question, I'm just now going through our chat as well. And of course, if there's anybody who feels that they would like to pose the question themselves, you are more than welcome to indicate and we will then allow you to pose the question um, directly yourself. I have one here um, that comes from Ilko and I hope I am pronouncing the name correctly. Um, and this is a question that's directed at you, um, Enoch. It says, to what extent do the rapidly increasing enrollments in online and remote education programs interfere um, with the geographical differences and, and forecasts. Um, was this element something that was taken into account um, as, as, as you put the report together, Enoch? You can repeat that. Uh, I'm not sure I got the full input of the question. All right. Let me try that one. So it says, to what extent do the rapidly increasing enrollments in online and remote education programs actually impact these forecasting scenarios that you've presented to us um, today? So, and online programs are good um, and they have the potential, they can uh, more or less uh, be uh, complement, they can complement the face-to-face -face studies. But the problem with Africa with online programs is the internet assets and uh, leaf, for Africa have not fully leaf rock. Uh, we have a scenario on leaf in which uh, maybe we're talking about you don't have a digital infrastructure to be able to have effective online study programs. So you realize that even with Zoom meetings and other things, it's difficult to have students being attentive and having virtual, you don't have the digital facility to be able to have a full online uh, programs. There are reports that have cited that uh, when um, Online, when students engage in online programs in Africa, uh, the quality of education that they get is relatively lower compared to face-to-face, -face, uh, partly because of the internet access and other stuff. So online programs are good, but because of the, Africa has not fully leapfrog or have the, the full infrastructure to be able to uh, utilize the potential of, of the online programs, uh, due to the low technology, uh, it's it's limited. But that's not to say that we should not do it. That is to say that we need to uh, be able to provide the facilities, uh, the technological facilities to be able to roll out uh, quality online programs to complement the existing structures uh, that we have. That if there are programs that we can enroll online and the technology is there and the facilities are there, it should be good enough. We don't need to uh, always be crowded in classrooms. You know, one of the main problems with education at the lower levels and most Africans is overcrowded classrooms. So if there are uh, facilities, uh, we have a digital facilities, we can look at uh, solving that problem with even online programs where students uh, substitute uh, comes and go. So they, are, they have positive impact, but as to whether Africa has a digital uh, infrastructure now, that is the main problem to be able to uh, benefit from these uh, online programs. No, absolutely well put. And I think, you know, this element of, you know, online learning, particularly brought about, of course, you know, by the lockdown and the pandemic as well, is something that is quite popular. I saw even Dion as well, Jerling had made a, a comment um, on that aspect that I think you've covered quite well, that even though currently um, there may be, you know, infrastructure deficits or challenges that currently impede most Africans countries from taking full advantage um, of the online, online learning aspect um, of things. It, it is not to say that it's not anything that can't be worked on and in future, um, you know, our various education ministries begin to take that into account um, as well. Indeed, it can make a huge contribution. So thank you um, very much for that. Yes, and I add, have another yeah, Sorry, oh, yes, please, go I'm on, just go going ahead. to add that um, I think in countries like Rwanda, or oh, oh, so is it Rwanda and Kenya, so there are uh, online learning facilities, like the uh, tablet that are given to students to facilitate their studies uh, during the COVID and then they are running out a lot of uh, programs. So there are examples, uh, like uh, Runa mentioned, there are examples on the continent also that can be looked at and definitely we must utilize the online system that uh, we can get tablets and with uh, programs uh, installed on them and other educational materials. Uh, instead of printing huge textbooks for students, there are ways that we can go about it to improve uh, the quality of the uh, So there are also best examples around that we can look at. Thank you. I just wanted to add that. 
No, absolutely right. And I think it really also then picks um, on the point um, that Renee was mentioning earlier on that perhaps when we're looking at, uh, you know, public private partnerships in advancing education, that this element of online learning is one of those areas where that could be ripe, ripe really um, for partnership. Uh, one question that I also then want to pose as well, and this can be taken by either yourself, Enoch um, or Renia as well, is that of course, you know, we use the term education rather broadly. And I was quite, you know, interested and pleased when I saw, um, you know, that in your recommendations, you, you, you make a call for, you know, for governments and ministries to also focus on the technical and vocational elements um, of education. So just to find that as you were, you know, preparing the report, this element of technical and vocational education, what role did it play? Did we focus on it quite heavily or not as yet? as well yes um, so the truth is that the state of technical and vocational education in africa is quite low uh, in africa uh, so you if you are supposed to by 2019 uh, the only about 15 percent of tertiary graduates in sub-saharan africa had a, a science and engineering background and the rates for vocational education in sub-Saharan Africa is just a quarter of the rates uh, in North Africa and other areas. So it is very low, and that is one of the things that Africans' uh, government must focus on improving the levels of um, uh, vocational and technical education to acquire the needed skills that are important for the job market because it is simply not enough getting through people through the educational system just uh, when they, they come out and they do not have any skills at all. So we must, it's something that is a deficit that must be focused on and uh, to be able to uh, leverage on that grow because uh, Africa is at a state where it needs more labor productivity in all areas. And if technical and vocational, which are critical to growth, is not uh, paid attention to, then it can be an inhibiting factor. So maybe uh, Dr. Arena can add something to that. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think you're right that uh, vocational training is completely un. Uh, underdeveloped in, in most African, or in, in, in nearly every African country. And, but these are the jobs uh, smaller companies actually would need uh, because you need qualified personnel in, uh, uh, in all kinds of uh, small businesses. And uh, the, the, the common uh, procedure is that young people join these, uh, these enterprises and just uh, look over the shoulder of the master and they try to copy him. Uh, and on the other hand, you, in your study, you quote that the German system, which is probably the, the most uh, uh, known worldwide, uh, but which would be much too complicated for African countries because it takes you two, two and a half years uh, of extra education <clears throat> with no real income. Uh, and this is not what uh, uh, most young Africans could afford. So we need a kind of a, a mixed structure between this complicated German system uh, and uh, what the uh, African enterprises need in order to prepare more young people that do not uh, uh, have the chance to, to get a tertiary education, <clears throat> to get a decent job in, in these uh, uh, middle middle class enterprises. Thank you very much. You know, and, and in fact, as, as we are nearing the bottom of the hour, I think you know all of these issues are now coming up and interesting um, you know, discussion this has been. Um, also interesting as well to see that I mean, within our Q&A, uh, you know, there are participants who are also engaging amongst themselves, answering and asking questions and, uh, and sharing amongst themselves as well. Really quite clear that you know, these discussions are absolutely imperative um, and interesting as well. So allow me just to thank you, um, Enoch, as well uh, for, 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 for the report that was presented this morning. Allow me to thank you as well, Dr. Rene, as well, for your really um, incredible insights in terms of, you know, what are the areas that we could possibly look into, um, you know, in, you know, to, to just add to the report and augment. But also other 
areas and elements as well that really leave us um, really education really can take us realizing and, re and, and, and realizing really the aspirations of um, our agenda 2063. Now, before I close, I'm going to ask uh, my colleague Judy, there's going to be a poll that will pop up um, on your screen somewhere. Can we ask just your kind indulgence? The poll won't take more than three minutes, but really just gives us an idea of, 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 of how the session went today, but also some key elements that we can look into in terms of future um, seminars and sessions and where we can definitely improve to make sure that it really becomes uh, a product that you enjoy engaging in. Um, allow me as well, as we close then, to thank, of course, the teams from ISS, as well as AUDA NEPAD. Thanks, of course, to Enoch, and thanks to our respondent as well, Renee. I really appreciated um, your insights. We are absolutely grateful as well uh, for the support uh, from the members of the ISS Partnership Forum, the Hans Seidel Foundation, the European Union, the Open Society Foundations, and the governments of Denmark, Ireland, the Netherlands, uh, Norway, as well as Sweden. So thank you very much. And allow me as well to take the opportunity while I still have it to announce the upcoming uh, seminar, which will be held on the 18th of August at 11 Central African time. Uh, and this time we're looking at industrialization. The title of the seminar will be the importance and impact of policies to industrialize Africa. So once again, please do register and join us on the 18th of August as we really look at how we can really industrialize Africa and really what the impacts of those policies would be. If indeed you've been jo you've joined us for the first time um, and you would like to just see our previous recordings, I believe that if you look in the Q&A box, um, you will be able to find a link there um, that will take you to where we have our previous recordings. But just for ease of reference, that would be uh, futures.issafrica.org forward slash events. Um, that's where you can find information on our previous seminars, as well as information on any upcoming ones as well. So allow me to thank you once again for your um, audience, for your attention, and we look forward to engaging with you again on the 18th of August. So for myself, Nico Koza, I will see you again. Have a good afternoon and goodbye. <laughs>